the START project works with the six freshwater species in central Ontario. They are the Midland Painted Turtle, the Map Turtle, the Snapping Turtle, the Musk Turtle, the Blandings Turtle, and the Spotted Turtle. Well, originally with the project, our focus was the Blandings Turtle because through the Endangered Species Act, there's a lot of habitat protection associated with our observations. But since then, we've actually moved a little bit away from the Blandings Turtle because we have been successful in covering a lot of habitat and protecting a lot of habitat. The entire season lasted from the beginning of May until the end of August 2019. Um, it kind of started off with something called boot camp where it was a two-week intensive program and we learned how to identify different reptiles and amphibians as well as focused on turtles in particular and how we could catch them. From then on we finished boot camp and we were broken off into different teams. Mainly people were put into different locations and from those locations they were able to scout out different wetlands in the area and hopefully find as many turtles as possible. And this went on through most of the summer. It is probably the best field experience I've had so far because it is the most in-depth. And by that, by in-depth, I mean the fact that I'm physically in the environment with the other animals. A lot of the other time I've been in the field, we're using nets or traps or something to bring the animals to us. Or when I was out on the ocean, we were using remotely operated vehicles. So like the fact that I'm physically doing all of the activities in the field this time is significantly better than any other opportunity I've had. The way in which we catch turtles is pretty inventive. We actually will put on wetsuits and go into the water and actually stalk turtles. I have seen a few different turtle projects run and this is definitely the most intense process that I've had to go through. It's also the most rewarding just because you're actually in the wetland with these animals and you're able to find them. We collect very similar morphometric data as other projects. So we collect the location of the individual, we collect the habitat, the measurements, so morphometric measurements, as well as their behavior too. So what are they doing when we find them? Normally, the first thing we do when we catch turtle, turtle, you check if it's been captured before or if it hasn't, take measurements, including the carapace, which is the top of the shell, the plastron, which is the bottom of the shell, just to help us see growth charts and things like that. And it's quite interesting the things that we can learn from that. We look at sex, we look at the condition of the turtle. If it's a species at risk turtle, we'll also take blood so that we can do some genetic testing, which is quite an exciting leap forward in the conservation community. The START project has a lot of data. We have the last seven years of data, and that is a huge amount of data for a project to be able to work with. Now, we're working with lots of different researchers and lots of different research projects with that data. Some examples include looking at infertility with uh, female turtles and their nests. We also look at temperature and using predictive models to try to determine when the most effective nights are to go out to survey for nesting females. And we also are looking at roads and substrate and how that affects where turtles choose to nest. That may help with artificial nesting sites. So I'm doing the soil substrate project. So essentially we took a good handful of dirt from every nest that we excavated, uh, the soil right above the, the eggs. And that's based off of a previous paper that I had read out of Algonquin Research Station. Personally, I would like to classify all the soil because no one's really done that before per se. A lot of the research about soil and nesting has been about temperature and moisture content and a lot of other things as opposed to the actual physical classification of that soil. And I think it would be really good for conservation work in the future and artificial nesting sites. Part of our job is to go and find the turtle who are laying their eggs in precarious areas and we're collecting the eggs, incubating them and then re-releasing them in the fall, giving each of those babies a much better chance of survival than if they were left out in Wild. Uh, working as a field technician for the START project, there was definitely some, some long slogs, some, some pretty long hours, but it's really rewarding, I mean, especially during nesting season when you're you know, going out there and you see snapping turtles or other turtles laying their eggs and you get to go and excavate it and your fingers first break into that, um, into that nest cavity and you see like those ping pong ball eggs. That's like 
one of the best things, one of the best feelings you can possibly have working as a field technician. So the START project has successfully been able to incubate over 25,000 eggs as of this season, which is a mind-blowing number when you think about it. When the eggs come in, the first thing we do is gently brush off the top soil, so we have a little bit of soil on top, and we'll get down to the eggs, and each egg gets taken out carefully so as not to rotate it, and we number the top, and uh, we actually number on the side as well, because we found that last year the snapping turtles all completely exploded their eggshells open. So having at least two numbers on the eggs helps us know which ones hatch, which ones don't, and it helps us keep track of each individual egg outcome. Um, another thing we do is move them into vermiculite, uh, which is an additive to potting soil. It helps keep the eggs humid, but not overly wet because they will dry out easily if there's not enough humidity, but they can grow mold if there's too much humidity. So it has to be a really delicate balance between the two. Um, and we record all the data. We have backups of the data so we don't lose where their location is or how many eggs are supposed to be in the nest or anything like that. They get put into a container with holes in the lid and then as of this year, they go into the, our large incubator, which is an entire room. Um, they need to be warm enough. We tend to keep ours at a certain temperature where we produce a certain, a, it should be a ratio of about half males and half females, because I'm sure you guys have heard already that a lot of turtle species have temperature dependent sex. We go in every day, we check the temperature, make sure it's steady, we check the humidity, make sure it's high enough, and uh, we see how the babies are doing and how they go. And uh, yeah, it's basically the process until they start hatching. It's definitely scary, but it's rewarding at the same time, because you know you're hopefully making an impact on the turtle populations in the wild. When you look at other studies that have been done, such as in Algonquin Park, that does suggest that about 1,400 eggs make one adult snapping turtle. So 25,000 is a lot of babies and is a lot of eggs, but at the same time, when you think about that rate of 1,400 to one, it's not as many as we would really like. However, our studies have shown that about 80% of nests within Muskoka are predated by foxes, raccoons, skunks, essentially anything will eat baby turtles and especially will eat turtle eggs because they can't run away. And so in that case, by taking them into our captive incubator, we're giving that, them that leg up, or we hope anyways, that we're giving them that leg up in order to be able to survive out of the egg stage into hatchling stage. It's so hard to see the work that we do because we know that every year so many turtles are being killed on roads. We know that populations are declining, but I think the work that we're doing is really important, both in terms of the actual field work, so helping turtle populations by incubating nests and releasing them, but also the community engagement. Having the community understand what we're doing and having them engaged with us in terms of just calling us to let us know that they found a turtle. Sometimes it's a threatened species, sometimes it's an endangered species. I think that that's really where this project is headed. And I think that's what is needed to be able to help the current state of turtles in Ontario, but also around the world. We already have people starting to recognize us more and more. And like, people are like, oh, you're the guys from the turtle sign and stuff like that. Like just based on the hotline calls from this year and last year, the community aspect is very clearly working. The turtle hotline became a thing in 2016, and we've more than quadrupled the amount of hotline calls we get. And it's so much easier for us field technicians, for a member of the public to call us and tell us exactly where we're gonna be finding a turtle that is a species at risk, than for us to just be driving up and down roads for hours at a time, uh, just not having any luck. We have members that call in 
every single turtle they find on their way into the into work in the mornings and that can be 15 or 20 turtles just call after call after call which is fantastic other people will call in regarding uh, really important observations like blandings or spotted turtles so we have had a huge impact on community members and the impact that they have then on the turtles has been really quite phenomenal it's always a challenge when we meet people who don't understand what we're doing or trying to do and there's a lot of pushback sometimes because people don't understand the importance of turtles and their roles in ecology so I think that getting the word out and having once again community members engaged with us and pushing this project forward with us is what's going to help in the future. I think we're doing some great work. I hope in the future we can kind of up some more of our egg incubation numbers and things like that, get the Georgia Bay Turtle Hospital up and running because that would help immensely. But I think we're doing good work here and we just got to keep the momentum up to keep it going. For me, working in a remote setting is one of the most amazing feelings in the world. Very simply because you're back in a state of untouched nature that you don't really find anywhere else. You don't get that in the city, you don't get that in the suburbs. It's amazing to feel like you're alone, even if you're with a team, and it's just you and nature. But it's not for everyone, you know? Sometimes it's inclement weather, sometimes it's bugs, sometimes it's just the fact that there are bears around or that, you know, there might be some other type of predator that you're not aware of that's looking at you. But there's also something beautiful in that because it's putting us back in touch with where we're from and it reminds us why we're trying to protect it. There are some really awesome people working with the STAR project. Um, I don't think I've ever been around so many hardworking young people that all have the same kind of passion for conservation and for uh, reptiles as I have at scale. It's never happened to me before. There are so many threats to um, our turtle species in the province. You know, having so many hands on the ground, doing that kind of work and directly helping the turtles, giving them a boost past their nest predation and, and that kind of stuff. Um, it really does feel like you're making a difference, especially at the end of the season when you have these nests that you've, you've excavated and have hatched and you get to release them back into the wetland um, and give them that extra boost. It's really, it's really something special, so. Turtles are the most diverse group of wildlife that we have. All of our species are now designated as a risk federally. Seven out of the eight are designated at risk provincially. In Muskoka, we have six species, and five of those are at risk on the provincial level, uh, and the six is now at risk federally. The turtles need a lot of help. Their decline has happened very precipitously, especially in recent decades, and that's almost completely due to uh, human influences like habitat loss, and especially lately, road mortality. Even where the habitat's still good, the fact is that adult turtles are getting run over by cars in ways that are unsustainable. And so that's a really big thing for us to try to turn around. And so we try to focus on those sorts of problems in a way that you know, some of the other species, they might not be doing so well, but those threats are harder to, uh, to assess and uh, to try to turn around. Also, people like turtles. And so it's a lot easier to build community support for a turtle conservation program than it is for a snake conservation program, for example. And the turtles have broad support, and if we can protect habitat for the turtles, then we're also protecting habitat for some of the snakes, some of the amphibians, many other creatures that depend upon wetland habitat and in some cases forest habitat. And so turtles are kind of like the umbrella species for us to work with in that sense. Okay, let's talk about being a field technician for the START project. So sometimes I'm out there on a wetland or walking through some barren with a wetsuit and looking for turtles and I'll stop and actually think to myself, this is my job. This is what I do. I just hike around, I look for wildlife that I'm actually really interested in and I get to interact with them in these beautiful scenes of Muskoka in Ontario. And, you know, despite all the hardships, despite all the bugs, despite the hot and cold cycles, it's really a rewarding experience when it comes down to it. And that's why I keep coming back to it year after year.